Welcome, Church of the Red Door. You may be seated. Not that I had to tell you that, but just in case you forgot how this operation works. Well, I know we lost a lot of folks last week. It was kind of the last gas for those snowbirds that were making their way out, watching eagerly. Uh, some of those who left early missed that 75 degrees last week. Was that not unbelievable? That was like a breath of heaven. Now, they don't believe us on live stream, but that actually happened. 75 is a high last week, so that late in May. Let me open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. We are so grateful for your spirit among us. Uh, we pray it every week, Lord. We're just asking you to be with us, to guide us. Uh, Jesus, you said it yourself. I it's better that I go away because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he's going to be with you and teach you and help you understand everything that I've said to you. That he said to his disciples and that prayer carries down through the ages. So Lord, help us, be with us. Lord, um, let us believe into this this morning. This is a challenging concept, the idea again of the unseen realm. For many of you have walked and understood that for many years. For some of you this may be a strange concept, but Lord, help us recognize that there is a reality that goes beyond what we can see, taste, touch, and feel. Help us understand that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, last week we looked at the schemes of Satan, and, and that alone is a hard concept for a lot of people to imagine. Now think about that. Imagine again yourself walking through maybe kind of a canyon. Imagine yourself on a movie set and you're kind of making your way through and there are snipers or people who could pick you off and you're well aware of that walking through the canyon and you know that you're, you're not very, it's hard to defend yourself against this. There's people up in the crags of the rocks. There's people up on top. There may be people around the corner or behind those bushes. You know there are enemies, but you've got to make yourself, you know those movies, you've got to make, yourself, make your way through this you know, this kind of terrain, and you're well aware of what could happen, and obviously you're have, you know, you've got action that you can take, and you maybe have a, some kind of a blockade or something that you have in terms of your understanding of what that defense may be. What about those people that are blissfully unaware? It's like the, and I don't watch them at all, but I know I did when I was a kid a little bit, some of those horror movies that I think are demonic in and of themselves, so I'm not supporting that. But, the, you know, it's always like, don't go into that house. Don't go into that house. And they are blissfully unaware, and they walk into this creepy, you know, kind of it, it, always in the middle of the night. And, all, you know, and you just go, what? don't you have any concept? Don't you understand that there's something in there? Jesus would have said the same thing, and Paul certainly said the same thing. Your battle's not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, spiritual forces of wickedness, and heavenly places, and they scheme against you, and we looked at that in Ephesians 6 last week. Before we do uh, get into the armor of God, so last week we looked at that Satan has a plan against us, maybe not us specifically in terms of him against us, he's not omnipresent, but there is the demonic realm, and there are principalities and spiritual forces of wickedness all around us, and some people think there may be demonic uh, uh, principalities that are assigned to particular places. You see that maybe even the book of Daniel that an angel had wanted once David started. Uh, Daniel started to pray, but he was he was with he was with restrained by demonic force for quite a long period of time. And so, what we get here is we get an understanding that Satan is scheming. And of course, the question is, well, how do we defend ourselves? Should be. The question that we all ask, and that's what we're going to get into the next two weeks. We're going to look at now the armor of God and what that looks like and what that entails on God's part in an objective way and also in a subjective way. How do we apply that? I want to take you back all the way into the Old Testament before we do that. I want to take you back to Isaiah chapter 59. Now, for many of you who have been part of Church of the Red Door, since the inception or been around uh, my teaching for a while. I love the prophet Isaiah. We see so much in the prophet Isaiah. It's so compelling. Why? Because again, there is no debate that this was written about 700 years prior to Jesus coming to the earth. Jesus is an historical figure. There's other works and extant manuscripts that make it clear that Jesus lived on this planet and that he died under Pontius Pilate. And there are texts that describe this messianic figure that would come one day, Isaiah being one of them, again, giving us this a good 700 years in advance. 
I want to start in verse 9. This is really uh, Israel. Actually, chapters 56, 57, and 58 had led up to the apostasy that was happening in Israel and the inevitability that God was going to have to come down and set things right with Israel. Why? Because they had been a call to be a light to the nations. And if you're non-Jewish here, and I know we have Jewish friends here this morning, but if you're non-Jewish here this morning, you recognize now that they were a conduit. All this book, with maybe the possible exception of Dr. Luke, were all Jews. And so they have been, for you have been saved by Jesus and his redeeming work on the cross. They've been a light to the nations, us, the goyim in Hebrew the non-Jews. And so, but God was upset with Israel. And starting here in verse 9, he says this. He says, therefore, justice is far from us. Now, I want you to think about the language that he uses. No justice here. And righteousness does not overtake us. In other words, we're lacking righteousness. Think of that when we get to the armor, okay? We don't have justice in our land and we don't have righteousness in our land. We hope for light, but behold darkness, for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope along the wall like blind men. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at midday as in the twilight among those who are vigorous. We are like dead men. He's using metaphors here. We look like a bunch of blind people groping along the walls. We look like dead people. That's what's happened to us. Why? There's no justice. There's no righteousness. And if you're blind, Jesus often would relate that to you don't see truth. You can't see it. So they lacked truth, justice, and righteousness. Now, when we talk about these things, there's always overlap among truth and righteousness and justice. But those are some defining terms here, and we see that they are lacking in those. All of us growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We hope for justice, but there's just not any, and for salvation, but it seems so, seems so far from us. Our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us, and our transgressions are with us, and, well, we know our iniquities. Transgress transgressing and denying the Lord and turning away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving in and uttering from the heart lying words. Again, a picture of a lack of what? Truth. A lack of truth. And justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away for truth has stumbled in the street. And uprightness cannot enter. Yes, truth is lacking and he who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. Now the Lord saw this condition that we were in, and I'm adding a few words, but you get the point, and it was displeasing in his sight that there wasn't any justice, and he saw that there was, catch this, no man, no man, and he was astonished that there was no one to intercede. There was no intermediary between the state of Israel and their lack of righteousness and their lack of truth and their lack of justice. There was no intermediary. There was nobody to step in between and make things right. And so he says this, and this is an astonishing messianic prophecy. Then his own arm brought salvation to him and his righteousness upheld him. His own arm. Now, when we get this picture of God's own arm, it's a picture of substance. Uh, It's my own arm, and yet it's not me. It's separate from me. It's both me and not me, and we would recognize that to be Jesus, who would come some 700 years later. And what is he going to be clothed in? Well, it says, and his righteousness upheld him, and he put on righteousness like a breastpiece or breastplate, depending on your translation, and a helmet of salvation on his head and he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and he wrapped himself with zeal like a mantle according to their deeds he will repay wrath to his adversaries recompense to his enemies to the coastlands he will make recompense and they will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun and he will come like a rushing stream and then finally and a redeemer will come to Zion. This is actually quoted in Romans 11. Paul quotes this about one day all of Israel shall be saved. And he quotes this very verse, verse 20. To those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. And as for me, this is going to be the covenant with them. 
Uh, my spirit which is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your offspring nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, from now and forever. It's a picture. Now, this is very challenging to try to unpack what moment in time is this talking about? Because Jesus is clearly envisioned here. He's the one with the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation. And he wraps himself in zeal and truth. This is clearly Jesus. And it's clearly his first coming. But does he actually come with vengeance? Not yet. Jesus came and he was very clear. He said, I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save the world. You ought to understand my mission. I am here as a lamb of God. I'm not here as the king yet. I am a king, yes. Remember, Pilate asked, are you a king? And he says, yes, but my kingdom is not yet of this world. If it was, I'd just instruct my people and they would, they would overwhelm you, Pilate. But he, he didn't come for vengeance, not yet. But he did in some ways come for vengeance. How so? How did Jesus in his first coming? Well, he came for vengeance on the unseen forces that were keeping Israel in darkness and keeping Israel in a state of lack of justice and truth. And so when Jesus did come, he came with, well, with great zeal and passion and like a warlike figure, but not towards us. Thank God, because no one could have stand. No one could have stood. None of us. Israel the Gentiles, nobody could have stood. If you remember 1 John 3, 8, it simply says that I came to destroy the works of the devil or Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. That's why he came. That's a, those are war terms, destroy and, de, and destruction. Colossians 2, I think of as well when it simply says that he disarmed the rulers and authorities and triumphed over them. Well, did he do that with literal kings and, and heads of state? No, he did that over the unseen forces of wickedness, the demonic forces. So Jesus did come in his first coming for war and used warlike language, but it wasn't for war against his fallen creatures, man. No, thank God he didn't. He came to destroy the works of the enemy. And that's important. So when Paul draws on this, now I want you to imagine Paul writing this letter to the Ephesians. Where is he? Well, we know, as we said from those many months ago that we started in the letter to the Ephesians, we know that he wrote this from jail. So imagine every day he's seen, every day, every day he sees these Roman cohorts coming in and these guards, and they would be dressed in all their fine regalia, man. They would have had it, they would have had it all, these grandiose, probably gold helmets, these massive breastplates, these large, uh, these large belts that held the breastplate in place and kind of uh, when they had to pull up their their longer garments they would tuck them up under their their belt and they had obviously the swords that would be hanging from that belt and then they had these really incredible boots that we'll talk about you know that were that would wrap up and be strapped all the way up to their knee with metal studs in the bottom that's why the Romans could march so quickly they could march twice as fast as any other enemy based on in a lot of ways their the way in which their shoes operated. They were high-tech back then. And every day, Paul would see that in prison, his Roman captors. He would see them, and, and then he would, I'm sure, flash back, knowing the Tanakh like he knew or the Old Testament. He would go back to these pictures of Isaiah that he had seen of the Messiah, and he would say, wow, our Messiah came and died, you know, as a, as a well, not as a warrior, but but." But the picture that Isaiah had was a picture probably not too different than what I see every day in these Roman guards. So this beautiful mixed metaphor of both what Isaiah had seen and then the very Roman guards before him lay the backdrop for us un to understand when he begins to say, now, you guys, uh, Satan's scheming against you, so what are you going to do? You need to put on the full armor of God. So I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 6, and let's just read this, and then we'll go back, and we'll unpack this over the next couple of weeks. Each place, I'm telling you, I could spend weeks on each piece of the armor. We won't, 
for as a function of time. But I need to spend two weeks and we'll kind of break it up. But let's go back and read first what he's seen. And this is, again, right in front of his eyes, both textually in terms of what Isaiah had seen and actually physically, literally right in front of him every day, these Roman soldiers. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Now, if you're new to Church at the Red Door, you're listening in for the first time, heavenly places are just a dimension that we don't have access to with our senses. It's not just somewhere way off in the cosmos. Uh, The Bible does talk about first, second, and third heaven. Paul talks about that he doesn't know whether in his body he went into the third heaven or not. Some would say that's just the sky, and then some would say that's the unseen realm, and then finally the third heaven, the very abode of God. These are places though that we can't see we can see first heaven in terms of sky and the celestial bodies in some ways but we can't actually see into these dimensions it's a dimension we don't have access to and again you've heard me say it a lot it's been fascinating to me I'll never forget when I very first read Brian Greene he's a a secular guy that he's an he talks a lot about string theory and I read his book The Elegant Universe and I was fascinated with how just how normally he talked about dimensions that we wouldn't have access to but that are very possibly and even probably in his view uh, accessible not to our senses but maybe to science and the math that would eventually work out eventually trying to bring together the the quantum theory and then the then the very large things you know the the general relativity and how those two things could come together and they they talk but he just talks normally about dimensions that we don't have access to I found that I found that fascinating so don't tell me please that I'm anti-scientific because I'm talking about dimensions of reality that we don't have access to and again I quoted Jastrow last week as well uh, who talked about look we, everything came out of nothing that's what they're telling us science is telling us so there has to be some kind of unseen force or some forces outside of our time and our reality that we now experience uh, how does something come out of nothing it doesn't and so don't say we're anti-scientific please for believing in dimensions of reality as we referred to last week so now it says therefore because these things are true because satan is scheming against you because there is a plot against you to destroy you. I don't know why we have such a struggle with that. We all experience these forces that seem beyond our ability to control, whether depression or other things, and, and then just the brutal evil that just doesn't make any sense that we don't see in the animal realm, really. I mean, we see animals eating other animals if they need food, but we kill people just because of envy and pride and all this other thing. And wh- how we can displace that and say, well, it's just some psychological problem You know, no, there's evil in the world and there are forces behind it. Therefore, because that's true, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. Now catch this. And having done everything, I want you to just really focus in on that. And having done everything, are you doing everything you can do to put on the full armor of God? Are you giving it all you have? Or maybe this is the first time you've ever even thought about armor. It's not literal armor we're talking about, clearly. But have you taken it up and are you doing everything you can to put it on? To stand firm. If you've done everything you can, then you'll stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, it says, having girded your loins with truth. There we have that Isaiah 59 reference again. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, just like that conquering figure that we see some 700 years before Jesus that we now know was fulfilled in Christ and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace in addition to all taking up the shield of faith imagine the faith shield with which you are able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one maybe this last week did you have any flaming arrows shot your way I did I did, and I have been over the last, well, I pretty much all the time, but I, I sense them when they come, and sometimes, sometimes I'm hit. Sometimes they get past my shield of faith. Sometimes, as we'll see, there, are little, there were little places in the breastplate that sometimes there were little places that could, that arrow could get into, and yeah, and sometimes I'm up, 
and I'm ready and I'm standing firm and I'm doing everything I can. And other times, one of those missiles just kind of, one of those darts, those arrows tends to slip by the defenses and you just get wiped out for a period of time. Maybe that's where you are today. Maybe that's where you find yourself this morning. Or maybe you're watching. You wanted to come, but you just could barely could drag yourself out of bed this morning. And some of those arrows have been hitting you. Well, I've got some good news I'm going to put on the armor. It's going to help you. And it goes on to say, and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is, just so there's no misunderstanding, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Now imagine the picture, imagine the picture. So take it up, stand firm, take it up, stand firm. Now the big part of this is take it up. God does not just naturally and singularly, he does apply righteousness to us. And we'll talk about this in a minute. But this is also Paul's admonition to put it on. Suit up, guys. Let's put this thing on. Let's put it all on. Yeah, when you get saved, righteousness is imputed to you, meaning it's applied to you, and then you're justified legally and you're made right. But there's a process by which there's power available, but now you've got to apply it. And in some ways, we see that in the Great Commission as it relates to having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Matthew 28, many of you will know this well. It's the Great Commission, 18 through 20. It says, And Jesus came and spoke to them and says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. By the way, stop for a second. Isn't that great? Do you know the one who has been given all authority? Or do you know about him? Do you know him? And would he say about you that I, that I know her? I know her well. We speak often, and I love her as a daughter. Would he, say about, would he say that about you? Do you believe that all authority on heaven, in heaven and on earth has been given to him? He claimed it was. That was an incredible boast if it wasn't true. Makes him, again, condemned as one of the greatest frauds of all time if that wasn't true. Oh, but if it was true, and I believe with all my heart it was, he's the man. And he's worthy of worship, and he's worthy of following for the rest of your life. And if you haven't done it, you can start that process today. It says, because that's true, notice, he doesn't stop there. He says, go therefore. All authority has been given to me. Now you take that authority and go. Notice, he's, he's won the victory. We don't have to win any victories in terms of the ultimate overthrow of these dark forces he's already done that he did that 2,000 years ago on the cross but we are to take that authority and apply it into the earth to expand his kingdom go therefore and do what make disciples you cannot make disciples if you yourself do not have the armor firmly placed on your body it's just too difficult you'll get wiped out you'll get discouraged I, t- I, have a, I have a sweet, precious friend who we hired a number of years back in Texas uh, for links. And for those of you who don't know, that these fellowship groups that much of this church came out of. And I was uh, on the phone with him this last week, and he'd been going through some real struggles. And I just said, let me tell you something. When you ever go into full-time ministry, meaning when you really put, you push all your chips in and says, I'm serving the Lord everything's going to come up. All those things are going to come up. Things that were, you just felt like didn't necessarily come up, little, little, little rifts in relationships or whatever that never quite exposed themselves. Everything comes to the fore. When you push it all in, say, Jesus, I'm completely here to serve you, you'll begin to find challenges come. Why? Because Satan goes, there's someone I need to wipe out. And then all those things that are on the inside of you, God says, I need to clean this these people up if they're going to serve me. And that's my, that's my process that I use the Holy Spirit for, he would say, to sanctify you. And that's what he says in Titus. He says he regenerates and he sanctifies. He redeems and then he sanctifies. He does both. It's powerful. So if that's what he says, make disciples of all the nations, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of this time, this age, this dispensation. Until I come back, I'm with you. I'll be with you clearly when I come back. But until then, I'm with you. I'm telling you, those are comforting words, especially if you're suffering. So if 
if we're called to take it up and that we have to take up this, this armor and recognize that it's our battle and it's not our power, but it is our task to enter into the fray, well, he's going to be with you and he's going to empower you, but he needs you to put on your armor. We have to apply his righteousness. Now, before we get in, one more verse. 2 Timothy, Paul wrote to this young guy. Paul, Timothy was, we call timid Timothy sometimes because at one point he said, Timothy, come on, you know. The Lord has not given you a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. Now, why would he be instructing Timothy in that way? Because Timothy probably felt like he didn't have a very sound mind. I don't know, maybe Timothy struggled with insecurity or depression or, or really struggled. And Paul had to really tell him, Timothy, you, the Lord hasn't given you that mind. Satan is coming against you. You need to put on your armor. You need, to, you need to understand how to defend yourself against these attacks. Then he said this to Timothy in his very last letter. He wrote two letters to Timothy. This was probably the last letter Paul ever wrote, his last writing, at least that's uh, in, in terms of the biblical account. It says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself, notice the language here, Timothy, if anyone cleanses himself, well, I thought the Holy Spirit did that. Well, it's both. It is the power of the Holy Spirit to come and cleanse us. And he does that uniquely, objectively, right when you give your life to Christ. But there is an ongoing process by which you have to also cleanse yourself. Not too dissimilar from you also have to go therefore. You also have to take up the armor of God. There's part in which God does, and there's a part in which we are called to partner with him. Does that make sense? So now Paul is saying you need to cleanse yourself from these things. What things? Unrighteousness? You've got to do that. You gotta, you've got to walk in purity. I struggle every day to walk in purity. It's not easy. I don't, I'm just telling you, purity in this day and age, at any time in human history, but especially in this day and age with all the stuff that that just comes in front of our eyes, whether it be a billboard or an, e an iPhone or, or the computer or television or whatever. It's just an onslaught of things that come in through the eye gate. And as a result, purity is challenged. It's challenged in my own life. It's very difficult. But if you do cleanse yourself from these things, you'll be a vessel of honor. Sanctified, that means set apart. Useful to the master. Now, notice, prepared. We'll talk about this a little bit more as we get into this, but you'll be prepared for every good work. Now, catch this. Now it says, now, Timothy, flee youthful lusts and pursue righteousness. Pursue this, put on this breastplate. Pursue righteousness, pursue faith. Well, faith is what we just saw, right? The, the faith is the shield of faith. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, your, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and love. Love's always built on truth. And love has to enwrap our mind to understand that we're saved, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He says, but do this, flee the lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Now catch this, with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Now, let me tell you something. Who, what, where, and when matter. You need to be with people. You need to picture it like this. Picture when you get up in the morning, you need to be suiting up. And they, they'll be in their homes and this and that, or maybe someone even in your own. But you get up and you're suiting up for the day with others who are suiting up in the same way. That breastplate of righteousness, that helmet of salvation, that sword of the Spirit. That shield of faith, those special shoes that are prepared with the gospel. And you need to do it with those who pursue him from a place of purity. That's important. So church is important. You can't, you can't really follow Jesus outside of community. Just be a lone ranger out there. It's just, it's just too hard. You have to be connected. You don't have all the gifts. You have something to provide, but it's usually for a community, right? We're all given a special gift. We talk a lot about it in here. I need you. We need each other really to walk this walk out. This is not just about you and your keeping it private relationship with God kind of thing. Uh, the very armor itself speaks against that. Your feet are already prepared to go, therefore, with the gospel. So are you suiting up with those who are what? 
calling on the Lord from a pure heart. It's important. It starts by cleansing. So now we see six distinct pieces of armor, don't we? We see girding our loins with truth. That's where we'll start. Put it on the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, Feet prepared with the gospel. Uh, The shield of faith and the helmet of salvation. And then finally, take up the sword of the spirit. Take it up. Come on, let's go. So first of all, what does it mean to gird your loins with truth? Sounds strange. The language is strange. It means mainly just put on this belt of truth. And again, this is part of the armor that, as I said earlier, that holds everything together. It holds the breastplate. It, it serves to connect all the pieces so we're ready for action. And again, it keeps these other garments from getting in the way so that we can be prepared to go into battle. Uh, truth is the connection between all these other pieces. We have to walk in truth, and it has to gird us right in the middle Uh, If you go all the way back to Isaiah, again, now the 11th chapter, listen to the language. And again, what Isaiah was seeing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the language again. You can see the language Paul's drawing on here. It says, also righteousness will be the belt about his loins. And faithfulness, imunah in the Hebrew, which really just means truth, the belt about his waist. So this messianic figure is going to come. And he is going to be girded in truth. Now, we know that's true because Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. I don't just have a belt of truth. I am the truth. And so what you're going to start to see as we work through this is that all of this armor, it's all Jesus. Okay? It's all Jesus. Each piece of the armor is Christ. It's all Jesus. Now, there's an objective side to this truth, again, and there's a subjective side. And I'm appreciative, again, to uh, Osborne because he talks a lot about this in his commentary on Ephesians of having both a subjective and an objective side. The objective side of truth is just this. It's here, right? It's right here. It's, it's established truth. It's the word. It's something we believe. We don't just think a few guys got together, wrote some things down, and then a few other guys who got hundreds of years later decided to get together and say, this is in, that's out, and all this. And if you, read, if you go and see the Da Vinci Codes, it'll, con- it'll, con- it'll persuade you that there's all kinds of other gospels like the Gospel of Thomas and this and that and, and that were not thrown out, but they, they were thrown out, but they shouldn't have been thrown out unless you actually go back and read, which I have, the Gospel of Thomas, it's ridiculous. It's, it's nothing Jesus would have said. And a lot of these gospels are just absurd. The reason was that they were dated way later. They were clearly not written by the apostle Thomas. They clearly have late origins, and they just don't, they don't work into the, they don't work into the narrative at all. They're little sayings. They're, it's more like Confucius says kind of stuff. It doesn't, and that's the reason they were rejected is because they were not canonical. There was a rule. They didn't date back or they didn't have connections back to the original apostles. But we do have established truth doctrines that are both church doctrines in terms of, but it really comes back to the word. If you have your Bibles, go to Isaiah chapter 8. I don't think I have this on the outline, but Isaiah chapter 8. I was moved this week to think about both the Bereans in Acts chapter 17. Do you remember the story of the Bereans? Uh, they, they came and they were Jews at the synagogue here. And, and they came and they, Paul began to talk to them about this Jesus was the Messiah. And then he was, had to die and be res, you know, buried and was resurrected. And they were using, he was using the text. What was he using? He was using the what? Old Testament. The whole church was birthed out of a text that had been completely put together 200 years, codified 200 years before Jesus. And here's what, here's what God said to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 8. Let's look here very simply at verse 20. 8 verse 20. Actually, let's go back a little bit. Let's start here in verse 8. 18, behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. I think that was a uh, foretaste of the disciples who would actually do signs and wonders in Israel. And it says, and when they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? If you'll remember when I talked about the schemes 
typically what happens is when you reject authority and then you have illegitimate authority, you'll tend to digress into a place of witchcraft. And that can be just wild occult behavior or anything where you try to control, manipulate, dominate uh, other people. And that's what he's saying. What happened is they began to have illegitimate authority. Why? Because they weren't consulting the God's word. And that's exactly what it says in verse 20. Forget all this witchcraft and manipulative you know, leaders who are, are not God's leaders at all. It says, go to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. There's no light in them. So you can remember that. Anytime you and your wife or maybe you're struggling in something, you need the direction. Lord, what should I do here? Can I just say to the law and to the testimony? This is it. Now, the law is not just the law, the Ten Commandments. The law can be referred to as the, for them for the first five books of the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We're kind of collectively just the law and the testimony. Just go to what God says. You got a problem? This can be your new mantra for life, to the law and to the testimony. And everybody will go, what is she talking about? I have no idea. To the law and to the testimony. The Bereans did the same thing. It says that they immediately went to the law and to the testimony to see if these things could possibly be true. And that's why you'll see many, many ministries, just Google it, Berean ministry of some sort. All, many ministries like to call themselves the Berean ministry or something close to it because, okay, so we have an issue, we have a dispute to the law and to the testimony. What does God say? And that's why we'll see the concluding part of this armor is actually the Word of God itself. So if you want to gird your loins in truth, put this belt that will hold everything else together that will also make you prepared to pull up those garments and clench them in. Can you imagine having to run after an enemy? Now, notice most of these are very defensive things. The armor is to, so you don't get hit by the fiery darts, but there are some offensive aspects of this armor that we'll see as well. But if you're going to go into the fray and you're going to therefore go and make disciples and you're going to be part of a community that desires to do that, that's why we exist, by the way. Church at the Red Door exists so we can go, therefore, and make disciples. That's why we exist. Otherwise, we just all sit home and watch television or play golf. I mean, we'd, we could pray a little bit and have our own, but we come together so we can be together and suit up together and go, therefore. That's why we exist. But to do so, we've got to be ready. And so this belt is important because if I get up and I, you know, and I had this long, you know, flowing gown and now I've got to, okay, I've got to run, man. I've got an enemy over here. I'd trip and fall. So what they would do is that they would reach down. They would pick up all these garments. They would take this belt and they would pull it up and they would clench it together. So they were prepared for action it was another important part of that girding up your loins, which is strange language, but it's just... Uh, for us, we might say, put on your yoga pants and your, you know, your, your tennis shoes and uh, get ready and get your iPod and, you know, get ready to go and listen to some music and go. Let's go, man. I mean, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us, but that's kind of a modern day girding your loins. Get some something you can run in. It's truth. You want to be prepared? It's true. So that's the objective side. Now, the subjective side of truth would be, are you living a truth-filled life? Are you doing that? Or are you living in hypocrisy? Now, none of us in here, myself, and I'll, put, I'll say, forget you, I love you, and you, you, many of you are not, but in some ways, I often feel like a hypocrite. I do, because I find my li life not measuring up to what I want it to be in terms of attitudes and various things that I do and the thoughts that I have. And, you know, I think too much about this or I think too much about that. And Jesus said, don't worry about that. Why would I worry so much about this stuff? Jesus said, don't worry about that. Well, why am I worrying about it? Why? Because in some ways, I'm living in this tension which feels a little hypocritical. Laura and I were, um, and she's not in here is the only reason I can tell this story. She's with the kids. But we were driving back from L.A. and I was doing more tests and appointments and, you know, UGG, all that stuff this week. And as we were driving back, I just said, you know, Laura, sometimes I feel like I'm just the worst Christian on the planet, which is not very encouraging for you as you're a pastor. But I just said, I feel, like a, I feel like an awful Christian sometimes. I mean, I just, and the closer I get to knowing who Jesus is, I just feel so 
almost like I'm way farther away. It's like when I first came to Christ, I felt so close and intimate. And in some ways, I feel very close now. But the closer I get to his glory, the more glory-filled he looks like. And I get closer to seeing him for who he really is. And then I look back at me and I've got, ugh. And I know I'm clothed in righteousness. And I know, you know, there's been a new turban put on my head, the Zechariah 3 picture. And I know all that's true. But I also know what goes on in my heart. And it's so different oftentimes. I have a new heart. God's put a new heart in me, but I also know that there's some levels of dissonance there and hypocrisy in my own life. And before I could finish, she said, no, I feel like a worse Christian. And here we were, your pastor, your senior pastor and his wife, driving down Interstate 10, coming back so we could preach the word of God to you, each saying we both feel like awful Christians (laughs) at times. Now, why is that? Because the word is like a flashlight We see this light over and over, and when the word, when you maybe for the first time really shine the flashlight of God's word into your soul, you'll find some dark crevices. But remember this, you still have the helmet of salvation on because, thank God, it's not based upon your righteousness that you are made right with God. It is the beautiful, wonderful righteousness of Christ that has now been imputed to you or counted to your account and you're clothed in Christ. So when God sees me, he doesn't see a terrible Christian. He sees his son. And that's powerful. And you need to know that. And that's part of putting on this armor. So again, the subjective side, just uh, is your life filled with truth, sincerity, and honesty? Are you devoted to the king? Now that's the truth side of the subjective side. The objective side is you're, well, I follow Jesus and he's my truth. And that's true. Do you believe that? Do you believe that this morning? So um, we're almost out of time, but I do, I do want to look at this last piece here, and then we'll close, okay? Everybody, are, are you all right? All right. How about you back in Montana, you people in Montana? Are you okay up in your cool place? Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, again, this piece covered the front. Uh, I think we have a picture of it. Yeah, that's a breastplate. And you also see these little, these little dangling things. That was also part of the breastplate, but they actually dangled down over your groin area. And all the men said, amen. <laughs> so when you're, when you're in battle, part of the breastplate also would you know, be these. Now, for some uh, lower-level guys, they might be something like this. I would have, ha- I would have been a lower-level guy, I'm sure. I would have probably had leather. Some of the higher ups got, you know, something that's a little more glorious. And sometimes you see these pictures of these, you know, kind of gold looking thing. I don't know if they were actually gold, but it's kind of a soft metal anyway. But certainly metallic of some kind of uh, metallic nature. And so, but anyway, it it went all the way around, also protected the back. And then they would kind of clinch it as best they could. But there were always a little bit of openings on the side. But it pretty much... These flaming missile arrow type dart things that would come in from Satan, if you start to understand, that's nice to have a breastplate of righteousness because it protects your heart. What does Proverbs say? Watch over your heart because from it flow the issues of life. So if you're having issues of life problems, like my life has just gotten in the way relationally and everything, make sure you're not being hit. Do you have Christ's righteousness on? And is it protecting your heart from these things? And if not, again, if, you, if your heart gets penetrated, it doesn't mean you're going to hell or that you're no longer loved or no longer saved. It's just many of the issues of your life. So we know that this is not a place of saints. It is both a place of saints and it is also a hospital. It's both, paradoxically. Again, objectively, we're saints because we're saints to Christ. Subjectively, we look around and a lot of us have issues, you know, and many of you maybe. You have problems, relational problems, and many of you have gone through divorces, and you've gone through difficulties with your children. You've gone through, you know, fallouts at work and all those kinds of things, and your heart's been hit, and out of it flow the issues of life. Well, breastplate of righteousness is very helpful. Pursue righteousness. Cleanse yourself from these things, as Paul had told Timothy, and that's, for me, good news. So the objective side, uh, again, there's a legal aspect to which you now are clothed in righteousness. And we're, we're, we're winding this down. We're almost done. Romans 3, 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, 
even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. All of sin falls short of the glory of God, being justified by your work. No, it's a gift. That's what we learned in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, right? We're saved by grace, a gift, unmerited favor through faith. By his grace through the redemption which is in Jesus, who God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at this present time so that he would be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So who has God's righteousness? In closing, we do. Why? Because we are people of faith, not because we're perfect people. I'm a person of faith. I never told Laura, I said, I may feel like an awful Christian at times, but I'm still a man of faith. I am a man of faith. So objectively, Christ sees me as righteous. And his father sees me as righteous because I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Now, subjectively, this leads us, well, our sanctification, our cleansing up process. I know I'm not perfectly righteous. I wish I was. But I aspire to be. I make it my ambition to be. I'm working diligently to cleanse out this cup so that I might be useful for the master's work. Do you even desire to do something for God? I mean, I see some younger people here. Do you have a passion to do something great for God? I do. It's grown in me. I did early, but then I was, I'd bounce around between my dreams and his dreams. And then something over these last 20 years has just continued to grow in me where it's now to the point of the only thing I want to do is be fruitful. The only thing I want to do is be useful to the master as a top priority in my life. And the paradox is he's beginning to give me those things I always chased after and couldn't find anyway. It's really a, really a paradox. So the subjective side, obviously, that's why we don't judge one another here. The only way we'll ever have a gospel-centered culture here, which means a grace-centered culture, is that I don't have to judge you. If you're struggling in righteousness right now, but you're a person of faith, I don't have to judge you. I may come alongside you, pray for you, help you, hold you accountable, be with you. But I'm not going to judge you. Why would I? I know my righteousness was given to me as a gift. Your righteousness objectively is given to you as a gift. The sanctification process is hard. It's not easy to put on the breastplate of righteousness subjectively, is it? Because I just find I fail in so many ways. But I keep getting up. A righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up every single time. A, an objectively righteous man may not be acting righteously at some point in some attitude he has or in some way he's treating someone. But when he fails, he comes right back to God and he gets up, he repents, he confesses, and he keeps going. If it weren't for that. So how, if, if that's true, how can I judge you? How can we judge one another? Why would we? That's just weird legalism. And so when you come in the church of the red door, you should feel love because you're being loved by sinners and they recognize that you're imperfect as well. Welcome to the followers of Jesus. And yet we're both righteous and saints at the same time. Weird, but beautiful, beautiful. So next week we'll pick up this with the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. It's one of my favorite pieces of armor to take up because it means I can run even when I can't right now. But spiritually, physically, I can't run right now. But spiritually, I can run. And I can run fast. And I love track and field. And I was watching this this last week. I just, you know, I always like to go to the track and field. And I wait. And, I, of course, they always hold a 100 meter, both men and women. And I like, I, I, it doesn't matter to me, men or women. It's just remarkable to me. I mean, the 8,000, you know, and this and that, I just, I, it, it takes too long to watch. And, I, and so I grabbed Tess the other day. I said, Tess, come in here, come in here. I said, this is the most exciting 10 seconds in all of sports. And she's like, what? What is that? You know, coming in here. And I said, well, watch this. And, you know, they all got down ready. And it's just remarkable. It's just 
beautiful. It's beautiful to watch people who really know how to run. I mean, there wasn't, you know, you don't see any of this in, you know, in the Olympics. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's down. It's, it's, it's chest up. I mean, it's all the things they teach you, you know, when I used to run track. I was pretty quick. I didn't, I didn't look as good as them, but I was pretty quick coming up, you know, and I, and I was a sprinter, and I just love beautiful form. And then you see these incredible, you know, go, wow, this is, those, are, those are feet that are ready and trained to go and go fast. And so we'll look at that next week. Is this helpful for you? Look, and it also, as we go through this, it will continue to put into your mind that when you have a bad week or you struggle, that this armor is important to protect you so that you never get to the place where you go, well, you know, God just, he's not going to give me another chance. I mean, God's done with me. I mean, I can't, I failed. I, I, this certainly goes beyond the pale. I, I, I just, I've treated my husband this way for so long and I just, I try and I, I know and I want to be different, but I just continue to act and behave in the same way, and so God's clearly got to be done with me. You need, your, you need your imputed righteousness. You need your helmet of salvation. You need this armor because Satan is what? The accuser of the brethren. And without this armor on, he will... Here's what I see. Here's the practical reality. People fall away all the time. I see them. They, they, well, what, they were coming to church. They were, they were part of the community. They were serving all these things, and then they, they, they just kind of go away. And then I wonder, well, why? Did they all of a sudden just hate us? Did, they, did, did the preaching get so poor? That, did the, was the music just so? Were they tired of driving? What, what was it? And most of the time, I'd say well over 90% of the time, it's, I find out that they failed in some way, and they felt like God clearly had to be done with them. They just didn't understand the armor. And we'll talk more about that next week. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this word. Lord, the depth of it, once we get into it and understand. You've been talking about this, this from the beginning. This wasn't just Paul's metaphor that he grabbed out of the air. Lord, this was your battle armament. Jesus, this was you. You were the one with the helmet of salvation. Why? Because you are the salvation. You were the one with the breastplate of right. Why? Because you, you are our righteousness. You are the word of God. You are the epicenter of the gospel. If you're the word, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So, Lord, it's all about you. Lord, that we would be able to clothe ourselves in you and know how to walk in this battle. Teach us. Help us to take it up this week. Help us to take up the armor. Lord, we're so grateful. And Father, I'm praying if there's anybody in here that feels well, God couldn't possibly love. I don't care what your background is. I don't care how, how many times you've been to mass or how many times you've been to synagogue or how many times you've been to this or that. I don't care or church or anything. I don't care. Do you know Christ? Do you have a relationship with him? You can apply his saving work to yourself without you having to do anything for your salvation. That's the message of the gospel. And anything else from that message is a perversion. So if you know that and you believe this morning, just repeat these words. Father, I, I didn't know you loved me. I didn't even know if you exist, but somehow I have the faith. Would you, I, I repent. I'm asking you to forgive me. Will you come in? Will you just tell the Lord this? Will you come in and live on the inside of me so that we can have relationship? And, I, and, and Lord, I'm going to follow you for the rest of my life. Lord, if, if that heart and that was only reflected in those words. But if that, those words reflect your heart, I can welcome you with all the authority of Scripture into the kingdom of heaven. You will never perish. You will have a restored body, and you will live forever with many of the people in this very room. Now just get baptized and come into the kingdom. And so we welcome you. Lord, thank you for this. And Lord, I pray now for communion upstairs. Lord, that we understand the, the body and the blood. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have a communion song for you to exit to. Pete, would you please? And by the way, Pete Dine did that worship today. That was good stuff. So Pete may have earned himself a job.